Bob, I just wanted to say thanks again for joining us. Really excited to have you on Training Thursdays, and I'm surprised it took this long. Yeah, well, it was funny when you reached out to me and asked. I thought, yeah, I guess I haven't done one of those. And I thought, well, is it is you know how much value is there going to be in this? They already all know me, but of course, it's just a small group amount of people from SEO Plus that have been doing work with me. Well, that's the thing, right? So just to to give the team a bit of a background. Um, Rob Dale, you're a business coach, uh, co-owner of uh, Rhapsody Strategies. Um, so maybe just before we, we dig into kind of how we worked with you and that kind of stuff, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and kind of your background. Well, I and uh, Brock, maybe you should uh, block your ears for a second. I was going to suggest to the team that we do a drinking game uh, that every time, <laughs> every time I say, as some of you already know, uh, then, you know, everybody takes a drink, but I'm only drinking water, so we're safe. I'll uh, chug Red Bull, so. You know, <laughs> uh, because, as, you know, as some of you already know, there are certainly people, uh, yeah, Alex's ears perked up at the idea of a drinking game. Um, uh, you, some of you have heard a bit of my story, of course, and we're doing, doing some of the training, but uh, uh, I'm one of the owners of Rhapsody. We, uh, we started Rhapsody, uh, we're in our, uh, it was in 2014 that we started uh, the company. Uh, prior to that, I was a uh, coach uh, with a company called Breakthrough Coach and uh, Breakthrough Coach merged with uh, another company, Social Catalyst, which was a social media marketing company. Uh, and they merged together to form Rhapsody Strategies. We no longer do any of the social media stuff. We bring in companies like yours to do that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, and we really focus in on the, uh, the coaching, uh, uh, the mostly business coaching, some executive training, leadership team training. Uh, we facilitate a bunch of different stuff with organizations as well, but yeah, a lot of fun. And you're, has it been five years now or a little bit longer maybe? Well, so it's been five years with Rhapsody. We're in our sixth year with Rhapsody yeah. plus another couple. It's been, uh, I'm in my eighth year of doing this. Prior to this, I was a uh, ordained minister. I was a pastor of churches, mm -hmm. uh, pastored a bunch of very traditional churches. And then back in 2001, uh, started a church here in Ottawa called Capital City Bikers Church. Mm -hmm. uh, Bikers Church ended up uh, growing to, at one point, we had five uh biker churches in canada 17 in the states and a bunch over in across europe um and it was really geared towards uh, not just the kind of people who would never be attracted to church uh, a lot of the biker community i grew up in a biker family it was part of my background uh, i grew up around a lot of outlaw bikers and so that was a bit of familiarity so we really reached out to that group to the you know street workers drug addicts homeless all of that uh, a lot of people who struggled with uh, their identity and who they were and part of, so even as a, as a minister, my passion was helping people kind of figure out uh, who they are and then how they live that out, the best way to live that out. Uh, and uh, when I left that world and, you know, not, uh, I'm a spiritual person, but certainly not a, a church person anymore. Uh, but when I left that world and we started into coaching, that's the philosophy we took with us was the idea that, you know, again, as some of you know, our, our tagline is, you know, you're meant for more is that notion of we understand that who we are, uh, our circumstances, the things around us don't define who we are. We're bigger than that. And then how do we discover that and live that out, whether it's as a business owner, leader, you know, employee, whatever that role is in an organization. Well, so, so I guess, you know, you kind of took the, the idea of what you were doing before and applied it, you know, to business, essentially. Yeah, you know, it, I didn't realize this early, uh, early on. It was probably about uh, maybe, well, probably about eight years ago, seven years ago that I sat down and I defined, I created a personal mission statement. You know, uh, companies have a mission statement. Companies have a vision statement. They often have their values laid out. Uh, every one of us, and I would encourage everybody on the call to take some time to create for themselves what's their personal vision what's their personal mission what's their personal values uh, and to and to then be living out what those are and and so for me i recognize that kind of my mission uh who i was born to be if you will was somebody who helped guide people to discovering how they live out the best version of themselves. And so whether the beauty of that is whether I'm doing, you know, owning a company that does business coaching or I'm working as a greeter at Walmart, I can live out 
in a different way that that mission. And so in everything I do, in whoever I interact with, that comes out. And so it was such a natural shift for me to go from doing it among a bunch of, you know, again, badass bikers to, you know, badass business people. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and I mean, that's so, I mean, to give the, the team background, I mean, I know you've you've been working with us for, I think about three years now, maybe a little bit over three yeah. years. Um, initially, we um, we worked with you on kind of a, it was more of a business assessment, right, with Eddie and myself? That's right. So yeah, we, we did the business assessment, I think the two of us, and then we did a, uh, the very first kind of real tangible work was we did a um an off-site uh training of the uh, kind of the leadership team uh and that was the day of the uh, big fire down in the byward market really remember that was that was uh because we were in the uh we were in the uh hotel doing the training when the uh, smoke started over oh, at uh, at the fish at the fish market and that's that's when we started with you was the day of the fire isn't Final that weird period. I don't know if they're connected or not, but well, I'll always remember that because sitting in that hotel, we could see the smoke across the way. I completely forgot about that. But you know what's wild is that in our first retreat we did, I think I don't think you were at that. That was before. Um, yeah. That was the day of the tornado. So maybe we got some vibes. Like, <laughs> Juju, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we kind of worked through that. And then we uh, yeah worked with our, our leadership or management group. Um, so with Derek and Amanda, and we do kind of quarterly retreats where we work on the business. And I know for me, like in, in my experience, kind of working with you, it's been, I mean, it's been transformational from, you know, from where we were, I feel like we were like an infant as a company to where we are now. I think we're transitioning into kind of adulthood, <laughs> you yeah, know? I think uh, we are. Yeah. So it's been, it's definitely been, you know, to be able to work through some of those things, like you mentioned mission, like just because we haven't defined it doesn't mean we don't have one but right. sometimes it can take a bit of help. So how you, how, how do you kind of, I mean, I've seen it, but maybe just explain to the team, how do you work through that? How do you help a team identify, like what is, what is their mission? What are their values? Yeah, well, so that's great. And I think it's, this is true. And anytime you're trying to uh, guide or help someone, uh, whether it's a friend or, you know, uh, you know uh, as a parent, when I'm trying to guide my kids or what, or in a business environment, uh, one of the things that I really uh, work hard not to do is tell people what it is um, because, it, you know, oftentimes, and again, we often, we're all guilty of this when we're giving someone advice, we're often telling people. One of our values at Rhapsody is powerful questions. We're big believers in asking questions that help guide people to discover for themselves. And so I would rather ask uh, questions that will pull out of, let's say, in the case of uh, if we're working on the values, I'm going to be asking, okay, Brock, what are your, what are your personal values? What really matters to you? Or, uh, you know, and Eddie, what do you, what, what, what really matters to you? Ah, I'm not sure what that is. Well, okay. Imagine you're, you know, sitting across, I, I did this just recently with one group and they kind of chuckled at it. Uh, I said to one of the guys, I said, okay, imagine the two of us are on a date. And, uh, he was like, okay, I don't think my wife will like that, but you know, go for it. And, you know, I said, um, what would be the things that would keep you engaged at the table and what would cause you to say, I don't want to be a part of that. Uh, or this, this person is not somebody I want to ever talk to again. Uh, that's typically, uh, is where you're going to find what your values are. And then when you find what your values are, if you're a business owner, if you're a leader in organization, your organization's values better align with your personal values or else you're going to hate doing what you do. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing for every, every person on this call. There's, it's an honest question to say, what are my personal values? What matters to me? What really gets me going? And if SEO plus's values don't align with it, you're in the wrong place and you're going to constantly butt heads. And, and I don't care how much money you make. I don't care how many perks you get. I don't care how many other you know things are a part of that. If you're not, working in a place that aligns with your values, you're going to be miserable. So I think for me, it's about asking the right questions. It's about uh, being deeply curious about an organization. And, you know, when I work with an organization, when I work with you guys, I really didn't know much about you. I knew of you because of some connections that we had, uh, mutual connections, but I knew of you, but I didn't know you. And, and as I got to know 
the team. And as I started to work with the leadership team, it was about asking questions. I want to know about the people that are involved. And out of that, you're able to help guide people into figuring out some of those things around values. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, for us, when we first went through that process of like, I think we had like 24 or something, you know, it's like, well, yeah, yeah, all these are true, but how do we like, how do we get this down to like five or four or whatever it is? Well, and on that, you know, part of the challenge was we create, so we created a list of values that, that we all, you know, all often refer to as these are aspirational values. These are things we aren't necessarily true in the company, but they're aspiring. One of the things we did uh, as a team when once the, the you know, the, as a main leadership, we came up with this list of values. We then went to the team leaders, the uh, the department leaders, and, and asked them what they saw as the values. And we were able to see then what are really what's, you know, being lived out and what value. You know, somebody can say, I value honesty. But then if their day-to-day behaviors, they're dishonest all the time or they're always making stuff up. Well, no, you don't value it. You can, you know, it's, it's just words. And there's a lot of companies. Uh, if I, I wish I had them in front of me. You, you chuckle. There's, there's this, you know, one organization. The values were basically integrity, you know, all around honesty and integrity. Well, they were the values of Enron. Yeah. And, you know, Enron, you know, of course, which became one of the most famous for uh, the deception and all of the, if your values don't align, you're not fooling anybody. So, if, you know, you come up as with SEO plus, we put a value on the board of fun, but everybody in the organization says there's no fun here. Well, we're not fooling anybody. So let's be honest. Let, let's say we're aspiring to that. Not that that is currently a value if, if it's not. And so it's, it's being, it's the honesty around creating the values that matter because again, the people that everyone on this call that works in day in, day out, you, you know what they are, you see what's lived out. Let's make it real. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, that's the thing that stands out to me the most is like from initially, again, some things might already be kind of ingrained in the company. People might be living it out. Whereas you mentioned like the aspirational. So seeing, being able to identify an aspirational value, and then see it lived out by the team. Um, I actually on on Monday at our Scrum, uh, I read out some some recent testimonials from clients. Mm. And uh, they recently, you know, the sales team did a blitz. We got five testimonials, and three or four of them in the copy specifically was directly referencing our values, saying yeah. collaboration, transparency, you know, all these things, accountability. And honestly, there was nothing like uh, more rewarding or like. You're making, you're making you proud of the team to see that right through to the client, right? Well, and that's a great and that's a great point, Brock. Because uh, oftentimes, one of the places that we fail to, you know, or, or where we, uh, it it can be incredibly valuable to ask someone else what they think your values are. And so if you're trying to figure out your personal values, for example, to go to some of your friends, go to family members, go to whom, you know people that know you, uh, co-workers and say, what do you think I value based on how you see me? So if, if I couldn't say a word to you and all you had to gauge were my actions, what would you say are my values? Uh, and it will speak of it will speak volumes to. So when you to your point, when you have clients using the language of your values that's when you know you've you've nailed it you've you've hit it uh and 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 you see that being lived out i know what my personal values are and so much of what i how i developed them is because i hear people say all the time people would say man you're so easy going you you don't seem to be you're you're very you know you're very open-minded you're not judgmental and well those come uh, i've come to learn those are values that i hold to to uh and how i live them out so absolutely the fact that those values are being expressed by by clients says okay we we got these right absolutely i'd like to um kind of bring up the uh you know big part of i guess your analysis and, and building teams that kind of stuff is is the disc assessment um yeah. can you tell, tell us a little bit about what what that is and, and how it's used well and that actually fits in beautifully with what we just talked about when it comes to values uh, philosophy of DISC. So DISC is a behavioral assessment tool that uh, we use here at Rhapsody. We've got a whole bunch of them. Uh, some of the team have used not only just we've got management ones, there's a sales assessment. There's We're doing right now five behaviors assessment. There's an emotional intelligence one. There's a whole bunch of different assessments. The philosophy of DISC is the more you know yourself, the more you can control yourself. So it's both in controlling the things that are good about your 
personality, about your your character, the, your style of doing things. But also, the more you understand, you know, okay, I lose my temper really easily. If I know that about myself, then I can start to say, okay, how can I learn to control that? How can I learn to be better at not losing my temper? So this helps us because it, it's it's the way that we come across. It's observable behavior. But the second part of that philosophy is the notion of being able to know others so that you can serve and influence others. And the biggest mistake we make. So. Uh, many many years ago, um, uh, I had I had a, when my, my first daughter was four years old. I, my second daughter was born. She passed away when she was seven months old, and so we went through this incredible grieving time. My my uh, ex wife, uh, Katie's mom, and myself. You know, as you can all imagine, uh, you know, any as any parent would when they lose a, a child. Um, and I had somebody say to me at that point, somebody was just uh, an old wise. Uh, uh, mentor in my life said, give each other permission to grieve differently. The way you grieve Katie's death and the way that Heather grieves Katie's death is going to be very different. Don't expect somebody else to behave the way you behave in that circumstance. Now, that's the deepest, probably the darkest environment in which you have to learn how to do that. But the truth of that has never left me. And the idea that even today, all of us, when we uh, circumstances happen, when situations happen, when even in conversations, we all react a certain way. We all have kind of built in style, behavior, you know, quirks, whatever. Uh, we expect other people to react the same way we do. And when we communicate, we communicate in the style that's most comfortable to us, and we expect somebody else to fit into our style. Uh, good leaders, great leaders, uh, and this is the whole philosophy of DISC, is the more you can understand the way that someone else communicates most effectively and you can shift and communicate in their language, in their way, the more you're going to influence their response. So if what you're looking for, let's say you're in an argument with a uh, you know, significant other, you're in an argument with them, and you just want to win the argument, you're just going to blast ahead and just win the argument. If what you want to do is come to resolution, the more you can shift and communicate in the way that they best receive communication, the more effective you're going to be in not only getting your point across, but also coming up with resolution, whatever that is. So I think that's the magic of DISC. It's just one piece. There's all kinds of uh, one of our three owners. Uh, he grew up in the home of a hostage negotiator. His dad was a hostage negotiator. And the principles of even that notion of knowing others so that you can influence others comes right out of that world of whether it's hostage negotiation or all of that kind of uh, area of having those kind of uh, conversations. And the more we can learn that, that stuff, the more effective we are in every part of our life. I mean, I, you know, obviously I'm very passionate about it. I could talk about it for hours and hours because I think it's such an incredible tool and most people never take the time to learn the dynamics of how to effectively understand uh, people who are different than them. Wow. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the, in a nutshell, that's what this would be. So how can, how can you, I mean, if you're just getting into this, let's say they get their own assessment, what is the best way to try to assess people they're working with without the, the other person getting the DISC assessment? Like how can you get a rough idea of where someone's at on the spectrum? Well, part of it is ask them, you know, uh, hey, listen, uh, when when uh, when we've got some major, I, I want to have a kind of, a, uh, you know, real heart to heart with you here. Uh, you know, how do you, like, how, how, what's the most effective way to do that? Uh, you know, uh, you know, some people, they love to get information and they, you know, I, I just need some time to think about it and process it. Other people, they want to resolve it right away. They want to kind of jump right into it. Um, I think, you know, part of it is figuring out is the person extroverted or introverted. And again, you know, sometimes we can just tell it's, you know, pretty, uh, in many ways, obvious to tell that, but it's also being able to, uh, again, ask them that question. Uh, I'm an introvert, but I come across in most uh, environments as an extrovert. And most people are actually quite surprised when I tell, when I say, no, I'm an introvert, like uh, doing stuff like even a call like this takes an enormous amount of energy from me because, um, because I much prefer to just kind of, you know, lock myself away with a good book or binge a movie or, or TV show or whatever. Um, uh, I do so much of my life is spent in it. So, so if I, if somebody was just trying to 
read me, they might read me wrong because mm -hmm. of how I behave when I'm in a group. So that's why it's good to ask people. It's not to assume things. Um, but I think the, the, the most, of, uh, probably at the top of my list of how to effectively read people is to come into it um, with an openness that you don't really know. Be okay with not knowing. If I go, if I'm meeting you for the first time, Brock, and I go, I have no idea what this guy's personality is like. I don't know how he likes to communicate or whatever. If I go into that with that assumption and awareness, I'm more likely to, uh, you know, begin the conversation by wanting to learn, by trying to, you know, get a, a feel for it and a sense of it. Uh, but there's a lot of body language things, mirroring people. There's a number of other aspects that can certainly be learned. And of course, Google, Google is our friend on this one because there's lots of information out there. But I think the best thing you do is come in with an openness to not just assume you know someone and, and what their style is. And the more that you do that, the more effective you can be at, at then picking up on those on those little, you know, uh, behaviors that might give you some telltale signs of their style. Mm -hmm. Well, one would, I guess, be like task-based versus people-based, right? Yeah. Yeah. When we're describing DISC, we certainly talk about the introvert, extrovert. Are they outgoing, you know, fast-paced? Uh, typically, those are people that want to, you know, resolve things right away. They want to answer stuff. Or more introverts are typically people that want to take some time. They want to process. They want to think through. And then certainly, there's the notion of task-based and and uh, people based people who focus in on on what's the task that needs to be accomplished who do i need in order to accomplish the task versus people who look and go who do i have on my team okay what can we do together as a team uh and so they they emphasize one or the other and i often say you'll even notice it and you you'll notice this now the rest of the day uh people who use i think language or people who use i feel language you know, I think the best way to do that is to, you know, go this direction, or I feel like we should go in this direction, uh, often tells you if they're people, people focused are often more feeling emphasizing task focus are very much focused on logic and thinking uh, type operation. So that's often a telltale sign. But even if you didn't have any of that stuff, like I say, if if all we did, if we could just learn in our conversations, I see this probably the number one thing is we go into a, a conversations already with all kinds of assumptions that are driving how we how we interact with someone. And if at times we could just shake that off and come into that with an openness to say, I'm deeply curious about the person I'm about to have a conversation with. What can I learn from them? Uh, if we went into a conversation like that with that openness, I, I think if we came into any, if I, you know, any area of life if we went in with more openness and less uh, i already know the answer uh, approach to things i think we would there's so much more we could discover about people things tasks projects everything in life i think comes from that absolutely what uh so i mean over the past six months i know it was about six months ago kind of at the beginning of COVID and stuff like that uh rhapsody really started taking a i guess a, a lead in community by doing, you know, you're doing some calls and, you know, getting, you know, working with kind of entrepreneurs and business owners and, and whatnot. Um, so tell us a little bit about that and kind of how things have progressed and, and what, um, what, what Rhapsody has going on right now. Yeah. I mean, when we started out when the, when the pandemic first hit, uh, of course, we looked inward and said, okay, what, what, uh, how safe is our company? And we made, we did some measures and we put into place some, some things to kind of make sure that the company will survive and be okay. Uh, but then we turned our, again, we're another one of our values is deep compassion. And so this notion of how do we compassionately engage with our, uh, with our clients first, uh, and then just the, the, you know, primarily the business uh, public, uh, are, you know, uh, uh, in, secondly. And and so we did a bunch of webinars. We started to really try to be at the forefront of helping people. We we made ourselves available for free. Uh, we all had in our signature, you know, click this link to book time in my calendar for a 20 minute support call, no, no cost. We really wanted to demonstrate. It, it, it came easy for us. It was just natural for us to do because it came out of our values. Mm -hmm. It was exhausting. Uh, I remember after about a month and a half of it, having a team meeting with our coaches and we realized that, you know, our, in some cases, our coaches were spending their days uh, dealing with business owners who were losing everything. Uh, you know, the average person maybe doesn't isn't aware of this, but most small business owners, uh, they they're, you know, their their house, their like their mortgage. 
their personal debt, everything is tied into the business. If you know, you, if your business falls, all that, you know, that everything that's owed to creditors, they can come after your personal stuff. And, and so you have people who are literally losing everything. Uh, and, and so we were dealing with calls where people just weeping through them. The biggest thing I found was, um, uh, we have a, there's a, there's a bunch of acronyms for this, but the word fear, false expectations appearing real. And what we found was for most people, they were, they were, uh, looking at the pandemic through the lens of worst case scenario instead of most likely a scenario. And so part of what we helped do was to kind of bring people back to, here's the most likeliest thing that's gonna happen here. We can't predict, we don't know, we still don't know, right? We're entering second wave, we're in second wave, wherever we are, what does that mean? And what's it gonna look like over the next few months? We don't know. So all we can do is plan out accordingly. Um, and and I think for most people, if anything, the message was a message of hope, but we really had to also even turn to our own team and say, take some time to breathe. Take some time to de-stress. Take some time, to, you know, to walk away from this. Stop looking at social media from time to time. All of this stuff, in order to to be effective in doing that, uh, incredibly rewarding to be able to serve, uh, you know, clients and and even just businesses that had no connection to us before. Yeah. Uh, it was incredibly rewarding to do that uh, in the midst of this. One of the things that really and I and I see this. We just had a conversation, you know, six thirty this morning. Me and my two business partners were texting talking about there you know another article that had come out where i guess the provincial plans for kind of phase two got leaked and and at least an early you know draft of it and we were talking about what some of the content was in there and and we all kind of just said you know what like again uh, our message needs to be to leaders that um yeah we gotta you have to plan for uh the unknown um but also recognize that you're, we're okay we're here we we're, we're at this place and and no matter what ends up happening uh you can survive uh what's going on here if again it's about keeping up it's all about mindset so so it's been a, it's been an interesting journey taking people to this place um there's still lots of fear out there of course we're seeing it uh but i think certainly among a lot of the businesses your business is a great example of this uh there's a lot of businesses out there that have done they did the right thing they did it they 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 took the measures that needed to be taken and as a result you know, you and I have had good conversations around this. SEO Plus isn't going anywhere. It's it's more than fine and can handle another. Even if there was another shutdown, your guys aren't going anywhere. You're going to be fine. We're in that same boat. And and I think to have that kind of confidence, and we're seeing that now with a lot of businesses, where they're like, you know, bring it on. We're we're we'll we'll, we'll survive this because we have the right people. We have the right team. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the right mindset, and we've done the things that were necessary in order to to be to be ready for whatever happens. Yeah, I think that's that's really great advice. Like, you know, one thing that I'm, I'm kind of thinking of is, you know, over whatever, over, over this period of time, um, it's been challenging. For me, like the hardest part, you talk about personalities, like personally, I'm I'm more C, so I take time to make decisions. I want to have yeah. you know, all parties involved with communicating. You know, it's going to be a little bit slower than somebody who's just like, okay, let's just get it done, right? Um, in particular, sometimes, communications let's let's talk with our team you know they have to, sometimes like i'm i'm more apt to not say anything versus say the wrong thing right, um, right. sometimes it's been for me it's been challenging to to be able to again communicate knowing when to communicate knowing when not to communicate um so that's that's been that's been for me one of the hardest parts right and like sometimes you still don't know someone could be sitting there wondering hey what's going on with this and you don't even realize that they're thinking yeah that. so you know and it's and it's I, you know i'm friends with a number of city councillors uh i know some people you know some some we've done training we've done speaking training for some members of parliament from some members of provincial parliament it's easy to um criticize leaders in an environment like this and i would say this you know uh i look at it even just you know um you know, when you think about what's one of the hardest things for a leader 
it, it is the being the person who's got to make decisions. You've got to, you know, you've got to make the decisions for a company, whatever. Uh, in a time of crisis, you're often making those decisions faster than you normally would prefer to make them. Uh, and and I always, I say this, to, I, I get into this with my friends who start going on about whether it's the provincial government or the federal government or the, you know, city councillors, ah, oh, they did this and they that, you know, and my response is often, go, go get into their shoes. Imagine you're 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 going in. You're getting some information. You know something's coming. You have no idea what it's going to look like. We've never. I mean, yes, we've experienced pandemics before. Uh, we've never experienced a pandemic in 2020 with all the other things, with social media being what it is. This is the first time we've experienced something this significant with all of the other uh, criteria that are there. Uh, cut these people some slack. They're still people trying to make decisions. And they may make a decision one day and realize, damn, that was the wrong decision. We need to do this instead. Um, and I think to give that freedom, and I think the same is true, and I've said this in many of the teams that I work with, is the, the leadership, so the leadership at SE Plus, and I've been a part of a lot of these conversations. There's a lot of conversations that happen where we're like, well, what should we do here? What should we do there? Well, we're, in many ways, you're thinking on the fly. And and I, one of my coaches, uh, who is usually pretty hard-ass, pretty challenging, pretty you know, critical of stuff, uh, this coach said to me, but probably this was back at the beginning of April, sent me a note, actually sent me, Eric and Trevor, all a note and just said, I want you to know how much I appreciate the leadership you've demonstrated in the midst of this. Uh, while I may have done things differently than you in some cases, while there are other things that I know you guys were, you know, uh, I can't imagine the burden that you've carried. You, you are focused on everybody, you know, so uh, thinking of everybody and just thank you. And that meant so much because, you know, like I know you, Brock, when you, you guys are making decisions uh, in the midst of this crisis, you're not making them thinking, how can we screw over the staff? No, you're thinking, how can we uh, keep this company as strong as we can so that all these people who are dependent on us uh, for income so they can pay rent, do all this stuff. Uh, and so that's an incredible burden for a leader to, to carry. Now put that to a municipal leader or a provincial leader or a federal leader. They're carrying a burden that could have an impact uh, for decades. And uh, I, I don't wish it on, uh, you know, but I, I think the idea that uh, we are going through something, uh, the unprecedented times is such an overused, it's, you know, we all want to you know, shoot ourselves when we hear somebody use that term now because it's so overused. These are unprecedented times. <laughs> there is no place where we can go, well, when this happened last time, this is how we behaved. No, no, there was there was no last time that had the same circumstances as this. And so business owners, man, I'll tell you, I've seen some incredible, um, incredible uh, business leaders rise to the top in the midst of something like this. And, and again, this call isn't about, you know, bragging on Brock and Eddie and Amanda, and you know, but you guys have really done a phenomenal job. And I think that you've, you've learned as you continue to move along on this. And so kudos to you guys. Well, thank you for your support. <laughs> no doubt. Um, I got, I, I'm, I'm looking at, I have a bunch of questions here and I think we, interestingly enough, somehow we've actually like answered. I had like, What's the hardest part of being a leader? You know, it, it yeah, all, we covered a few of them. Right? Um, so, oh man, what, uh, like, how do you replenish your energy? What do you do for fun? Uh, well, I, so even, so here's in, interesting. Uh, uh, so I, I took up golfing last year. So normally I'd say one of the ways I replenish my energy is to get on the golf course. But my very first golf game, because it's 2020, uh, my very first golf game of the year, I, I strained a bunch of ligaments in my knee. And I haven't been able to play since. And so now not only am I not getting to do the things I normally do, but I've been in pain uh, and doing physio throughout the, the, the rest of it. And so, um, you know, I, I haven't been able to kind of do that kind of stuff for fun. But I think for me, it's uh, I think at the top of the list is, again, I'm an introvert. I give myself permission to isolate. And so there are times when. Uh, and, it, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I've got other people living here with me, but there are times when I can just say, so I'm a, a big cigar. I enjoy a nice cigar. There are times when I just go, okay, I'm going to go sit out in the backyard or sit in the garage if it's raining. I'm going to have a cigar. That cigar is going to last me a good hour, hour and a half. And I'm completely alone. People know, even, in, you know, uh, people in the house and that Rob's out having a cigar, just leave him alone. Uh, you know, nothing needs to be. And I, and I, and when I do that, I don't bring any of my technology with me. 
uh, because I want to just kind of lock myself out. If I am, I'm doing something where I'm just binging a show, uh, watching a show or reading a book or whatever. But uh, so it's that isolation piece. The other thing that I've learned, and I've really only started to do this a bit more effectively in the last little while, especially as my knees been getting better, uh, exercise, lots of, you know, proper amount of sleep. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for me again, reading, drinking lots of water. Um, it's, it's all of that stuff is where I get my energy. It's knowing where you get your energy. If you're a high eye on the disc profile or an extrovert, you're going to get energy by surrounding yourself with people. Well, social, social distancing, that's pretty hard to do. So I think, I think probably introverts have an advantage right now of being able to replenish energy because you're doing the right thing when you isolate yourself. Um, but I, you know, I think that there are ways you can find to do that by connecting, however that might be, but for me, that's some of the ways that I do it. So when you're, when you're having a cigar, like, is this, do you find that's like a creative time for you at all? Like, uh, it, 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 can, it can be again, sometimes, sometimes it's the creative time. But again, sometimes, so I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a doer. I'm always on the go. I'm always working. I love what I do. So I have no problem. I'm working. There's rarely a weekend that I'm not doing something. Uh, I mean, I took a break from that again, just because it got pretty emotional with everything with COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, but so sometimes, like I say, when I'm having that cigar, sometimes it can be a creative moment where the creativity comes is because sometimes I just stop and I do nothing. You know, one of the one of the other things I do, and and you know, this certainly builds creativity for me. Uh, I may even light up a cigar and then go for a walk. And when I'm out going for a walk, I'm not no headphones on, no you know cell phone with me. Um, I'm purposely trying to be in that moment and just trying to you know uh, enjoy that time. I. Uh, uh, years ago, I had a Doberman, and I uh, used I lived downtown at the time, and so I would take the Doberman. Uh, his name was Ruger, and I would Ruger and I would take this walk from our apartment. We li I lived in the kind of bank and uh, sorry Bay and Slater area, and I would take this walk down to the uh, to the river, all the way up to Parliament Hill, and then back around. And there's about an hour long walk, and I that was my time to listen to podcasts. I'd throw on the headphones, and I'd listen to a, a podcast, and, and I was listening to a podcast one time walking along the river, and and the podcast was all around about being in the moment. The person was talking about how they go on walks and you know kind of hearing the birds and all this stuff, and I realized. That I wasn't in the moment at all that I was listening to a podcast. So I turned off the podcast, took out the headphones, and just all of a sudden, I discovered the Ottawa River, like experiencing just walking by the river in a way that I never had before. And so I started to do that, or sometimes it was by the canal, I'd go and sit by the canal. Uh, and it's incredible what you discover, even in your, even I, I live out here in Barhaven now, uh, and even out here when I've got two now little dogs, but I go for a walk with the dogs, no headphones, nothing. It's amazing what you discover about your neighbors, about the, you know, the streets, the character and the, you know, uh, and being in the moment, that's, I think for me, where, where then I'm getting creative and I'm getting energized and all of that stuff by just experience whatever's happening. We, we were so locked in in our culture today of, of technology that we miss all of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Like, have you, have you been to, um, in Barhaven, the little conservation area beside the bridge, like the pathway there. No, I haven't. Yeah, I have to check. I'll send you a, a oh, spot later. It's it's yes. amazing. I bring the kids there and we'll walk. It's like a boardwalk all around the water and like under the bridge. Yeah. It's it's. I love it there. It's fantastic. Yeah, and I like I know that most of your team aren't in the office right now, but you know, even even you know, uh, Preston Street like when you're in the office to get out and just take a walk down Preston street and, and use, and again, uh, I can't stress it enough. It's, there are times we just, I, I'm reading, uh, reading a couple of books right now. One of the books I'm reading though, is this book called, um, Oh, what's it called? I've got the, uh, I wrote it down here. The, uh, um, uh, not irresistible, but, um, uh yeah it is irresistible it's the it's it's irresistible the rise of addictive technology and it's this whole notion of how that technology is designed and you guys know this probably better than me being in in the world that you're in but it's designed to get people to to look more to to be more focused on it and there is something powerful by putting that stuff aside and walk down Preston Street without your phone, without your headphones, you know, all of that. Don't look at anything, but just look at the people sitting in the patios eating. Look at the restaurants. 
you'll discover stuff. You'll go back to the office going, oh my God, I never knew this. Or you should have seen what I saw, or was this ever cool? And, and, and all of a sudden you'll start to see ways you can apply that to, to, uh, to even your, um, even to your, what you're doing in your work world. Yeah. I mean, it's actually uh, an interesting article I came across where it said maybe one of the, one of the most useful skills in 2020 or today is focus. So, yeah. and the discipline. So for example, cell phones, the discipline to be able to put it to the side, focus on, you know, the task at hand because multitasking distract is a killer, right? Yeah. We're, we're all laughing because as soon as you said the word focus, your camera went out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> right now you're all blurry you're all blurry bro and, and, and right talking. when you said focus you just there you go now you're back now you're focused <laughs> uh, uh it really is though it's incredible how much we uh avoid that and and i think for a lot of people they're afraid of the silence they're afraid of the um you know being in the moment i know i was for years i was for years i was somebody who was always striving to impress always striving to achieve i was always looking at other people thinking if only i could do what they're doing and i was not a big fan of of who i am um uh, you know um rob dale was uh, was low on the list of people that impressed me and uh you know for me it was when i got to that point of learning that uh, hey you're all right um, and then I was, then I became much more okay, uh, being in silence, being in the moment, um, go to a sporting event or go to any event where they say, we're going to do a moment of silence. One, they all lie because never do you see a moment of silence. Uh, I usually see about 30 seconds or 10 seconds or whatever. Hell go into a, a zoom call with everybody on a call like this, we won't do it today, although it would be an interesting experiment. Go into a Zoom call like this and say, okay, we're just gonna sit in silence for a minute. But you especially do it in person, you watch how awkward everybody gets. Because we can't do it. We're, we're designed not to be able to do that. And I think there's we're missing something powerful by, by, losing, by losing that. And so take a walk, go, as crazy as cliche as this is smell the flowers you know like uh uh you listen to the sounds in your neighborhood that uh you know and and uh get past the, the the noise of the traffic and then listen to the other sounds and it's incredible what you can hear when you stop and listen and take the time to hear it it really is and it, it's important just for that balance like i know personally i've been going like go 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 for i don't know how long and I know yesterday just, you know, came home at the end of the day and went in the backyard with the kids and ran around just kicking a ball, going on the trampoline, just as you know, hearing the kids laughs and moving around and things you're not planning, but it just kind of happens. And in the moment, and it, honestly, it, it kind of rejuvenates you a little bit. Yeah, it really does. It, that's, you're, you're absolutely right. Especially when it's, you get to hear, I, I mean, laughter uh is 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 you know um to hear laughter especially the laughter of kids whether even if you hate kids <laughs> to hear that laughter right there's there is a sense of innocence to that and you know unless you're unless it's you know when you're trying to nap or sleep but uh <laughs> or, no, but it's it, you know yeah I wish those kids would stop laughing i'm trying to sleep <laughs> um, no but you know when you're again when you're in those moments of, of reception some of you meditate and and uh, i don't i'm not a uh I, I don't have a, a discipline around meditation, um, but I do know this is that in moments when I do take the time to do that, um, it, there is something powerful that happens when you're, because it forces you to really just, uh, you whether it's the word focus or you're in that moment where you really do kind of just pause and, and it's a practice, it's a discipline, it's hard to get the noise out of our heads. Uh, you know, uh, one of my clients years ago coined the phrase, and I, I don't know where he first got it, but he, in a testimonial about me, he said, Rob helps me get out, uh, helps me take out the head trash. And as a team, we've never forgotten that. There's this notion we all have head trash. And when we learn sometimes to just take the head trash, put it at the curb and let it, the garbage men come and take it away, uh, it, it frees you up to other thinking. Absolutely. I like that. All right, Rob, I think, uh, people are probably chomping at the bit to get some questions here. So <laughs> I see there's already one in there and then I'll, I'll open up the floor. Anyone else wants to, has a question for Rob, pop it in the chat. I saw, I saw Jake's question in there and I was going to ask him just to maybe if he could, uh, clarify kind of exactly what he means by that, because I could take that in a bunch of different ways. 
Okay, so I'll read it out. So do you think that people with different DISC personalities carry through to demonstrate differences in their behaviors as it relates to transactional conversions and the customer journey, consumer journey process in e-commerce transactions and sales? Uh, Jake, do you want to give a bit more context for Rob on that? For sure. Yeah, Rob, just wanted to ask, I guess, you know, as it relates to like more to our industry and we kind of think of, you know, the consumer journey process as they go, you know, towards, you know, researching from a particular, you know, industry and or service that they might, you know, be uh, looking to make a transaction in soon all the way through to, you know, narrowing down their focus towards, you know, different companies and then actually making the purchase uh, that leads to a sale. You know, do you notice through some of your, your, your different personalities and traits that, People with these, these dif different characteristics, you know, go through the, this life cycle at a different at the different times, or they make different decisions amongst it. Right. So, yeah, I thank you for the clarification there. Um, uh, absolutely, and I think that uh, both. So, uh, your disc style is going to is going to um, your there's certain strengths and challenges. I always say to people. Uh, when you do a disc style, there's nothing in there that says you can't do something. So, for example, as a I'm an S on the disc style, as an S who is more that introvert, more people focused, more quiet. Um, but uh, um, you know, the uh, <laughs> I'm laughing at the Dallas <laughs> question comment. Um, the you know, having the uh, uh, my style the way it is doesn't mean I can still stand up in front. I've stood in front of crowds of a, you know, I've, I've stood in crowd front of a crowd of almost 10,000 people and spoke uh, hundreds of, you know, I can do all of that. I can, and I, and I, from what I, everyone, you know, what I'm told, I'm really good at public speaking. Um, so I can do it. It just takes energy. And so that's the same to be true. On the flip side, when you're communicating with someone else, absolutely disc affects the sales process and, and uh, their buying cycle. I say on a website, for example, when you're creating, for those of you that work in, in uh, creating websites, these are looking at headlines. They're looking at what's in it for me. The, a D personality is never going to read the entire website. Whereas a C person, you know, somebody who is a C who likes all the details, you know, Brock fits into this, uh, this part of it, is going to read most of it. He's going to, is not afraid to read this, the uh, fine print and, you know, look at all the footnotes in an article or whatever the case might be. The details in there, when you're crafting an email, I had a client one time who owned an event company and uh, she came into one of our meetings frustrated because she was running this pretty major event. And the person, and she was, I'm, tr I'm frustrated. I'm trying to get all these answers to a whole bunch of questions. And the person's not replying. I keep sending them emails and they don't reply or every once in a while I get an answer and they answer one of the questions but there's 10 questions in the in in the email to them and so you know we kind of quickly said well are they ex extrovert introvert people focused uh, project focused we determined this person was an i and uh, some of you on this call are eyes i'm gonna be you know i i think i uh, i'm this guy i have pretty co some confidence is okay with me picking on him would be rory you know rory is an i well if you need a bunch of information from rory one of the best things you could do is and i is what i said to this event planning client was send uh, instead of sending one email with 10 questions, send 10 emails with one <laughs> question in each email. And they're much more likely to do it because here's what oftentimes an eye will do. An eye is going to get some information and there's so much information, they it's almost overload. They go, oh, I'll deal with this later. Or, yeah, yeah, I can do this. And then they answer the first thing and they get distracted, squirrel, something else happens. And they just hit send without getting into the details of it. Whereas if you send, if you give them a little bit here, there, uh, they're able to take it in bite-sized pieces. And, and so she tried this with this client, sent out 10 emails, 10 questions, 10 things she needed to know, all separate emails. The client within an hour answered every single one of them because it was in bite-sized, easy to digest uh, uh, pieces. So if I'm communicating with a client who I've determined is a D, I'm giving headline. I'm just giving them the, what do you need to know in order to, to be successful here? If I'm communicating with an I, I'm giving them bite-sized pieces of information so they can kind of process that. If I'm communicating with an S, I'm expressing how much I appreciate how helpful they're going to be to me if they respond because they want to be able to. If I'm communicating with C, I'm giving them, I'm trying to think of every potential question they might ask and, and try to respond in the email with that because I'm gonna give them as much information as they need. So absolutely, when I'm communicating with people, whoever I'm communicating with, I shift into that style. Nice. On uh, any coaching book you would recommend? 
Uh, great question. Um, there's so many of them, and I uh, um, uh, there certainly there's there's a couple of really good ones on questions. Uh, powerful questions, I think it's called. I'm sorry, I'm turning my head, but I because I've got a bunch of them on here uh, that are on my bookshelf. Uh, and I can't remember if it's, I have it as an ebook or a hard copy. There's one called Powerful Questions. It's, it's, it's really fascinating book around, it's not just good for coaching, uh, but it takes into the idea of how to ask really powerful and effective questions. Uh, almost every um, invention we have uh, comes out of the fact that somebody asked a simple question. So they tell the story in this book. There's a story told about um, the inventor of the Polaroid camera. He invented the Polaroid camera one day because he was at the beach with his daughter and he took a picture of his daughter with a normal camera. And, and the daughter said, Daddy, why can't I see the picture right away? Right, different today, we're in a different world. But at that point he went, yeah, why can't you? And he began to explore why that uh, was the case. Uh, the windshields, same thing. Uh, you know, this guy was driving in a, he was in his car, happened to be again, his daughter is, is, is a six year old daughter in the car and it was raining out. And his daughter said, daddy, why can't the windshield blink? When I, my eyes get watery, I blink and it washes the water away. Why can't the windshield blink? And he was like, and he invented the uh, windshield wipers. So I think that there's some some uh, um, uh, around that stuff. I think that it's it's it. Those are it's, it, that's the kind of book. It's a great book that lists a whole bunch of questions around that. So children are the most innovative, by the sounds of it. <laughs> that's, well, but but you know what, Brock? What what that does tell you, and, and again, you go into that. So uh, early children, six years and under. Uh, are, are incredible. Daddy, why is the sky blue? Why is this? Why is that? Why is this? Right? You've experienced this. Yeah. Then what happens at around six or seven? We stick them in an educational system that tells them answers. Stop asking questions, start learning answers. And even when you write an exam, what do you do on the exam? You recite what the answer is supposed to be. We've stopped, te we stopped teaching people to ask questions. And as adults, we get to a point where now, there are so many brilliant people on this call with brilliant thoughts and questions that are afraid to ask the question because why? I don't want to look stupid. And if we could just get back to where one of us said, hey, why, why, why do we do it this way? Or why is this, you know, the thinking? Uh, mm -hmm. Incredible things, creativity can come from asking questions. And, but the thing is, is that we, as a society, we stop people from asking questions once they hit about six years old grow up and stop asking questions yeah i think i mean for us i think one of the most important activities is just like being able to brainstorm like learning how to brainstorm so it's like eddie and i that's something we're really good at and it's like no idea is a bad idea sometimes we'll poke fun at each other for, but you know but at the end of the day like anything goes in a brainstorming session right well and and you know hey some ideas are bad ideas for sure but let's flesh <laughs> them out to determine if they're bad because sometimes a bad idea leads to a good idea and so in a brainstorming session one of the best things we can do is and this is where i when i lead a team through brainstorming it's let's get every idea on the board no questions around well how would we make that work nope that's not the time to do this right now we're just throwing the ideas that we'll figure out which ones work and which ones don't mm -hmm. after we're done brainstorming uh, but we've lost that there's a really good ted talk uh by bill gates of of all people uh, on education. And he talks about the education system in the States. It's, it's like 10 years old, this Ted talk or something like that. One, it's, it's a really good, you want to learn how to present well, to use slides of, uh, effectively. It's a great one for that. I, I can't remember the name of it, but I, I don't, I don't imagine Bill Gates has that many Ted talks that it wouldn't yeah. be easy to, it wouldn't be hard to find that. Nice. We got some other questions here. Yeah. So Alex, Conflict is an inevitable part in a workplace. What advice do you have to ensure the conflict stays productive and how do you, how you may want to act differently in this scenario when considering the other person's diss style? Oh, good question. It's like we just talked about conflict or something <laughs> in a team training, Alex. Um, I, I think that again, it comes down to, of course, uh, productive conflict. We often talk about this is that, uh, um, our initial reaction in conflict is to, uh, there are all kinds of, of unwritten scripts that we have in our, 
our brains, stuff that maybe we were told as, you know, as children, our parents told us this, or because of whatever religious background or cultural background, these were taught to us. And when we respond quick, we respond out of our, 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 our these unconscious uh, 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 scripts, these, un, uh, you know, unworded uh, scripts, the, these, these uh, things that are, they drive our actions. If we can pause and kind of reflect where we're coming from on that. And then also, again, um, if, if you show up, you know, you show up uh, at work and you're late and Brock starts, you know, he, he, he kind of starts yelling at you, you're late, blah, 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 blah. Your first reaction is, well, I had a good excuse. I, you know, why did you, you, you just assume this? You didn't, you didn't take the time to really understand my perspective on it or w- what was going on. And yet we'll do the same thing to somebody else. So we're very quick to expect people to un- be understanding about us. Um, but we're very quick to not be understanding for the very same thing to somebody else. That comes down to these scripts. And so the more we can learn and put ourselves in the shoes of someone else and say, okay, are they really, is this conflict really them attacking us personally? Or is this something that is, you know, that we need to just talk through and work through together? I heard, I went, I took in a webinar recently around uh, this stuff. Uh, and it was really good because they talked about that there are three kind of, there are, uh, it's understanding context, then um, pattern, and then uh, relationship. Sometimes when something happens once, it's the context. Okay, what what was the scenario? Why did that happen? My dog ate my homework. Okay, well, if 10 times in a row, the dog eats the homework, there's a pattern. Okay, what do we do to keep the dog from eating your homework? Then it gets into relationship. If the dog keeps uh, eating your homework and you don't do anything to change it, now it's affecting the relationship. So in every conversation, it's to ask yourself, okay, this conflict that's happening, is this a context uh, conversation? Is this a pattern conversation? Is this a relationship conversation? Uh, so that's one of the ones that I haven't, I don't think I've given that to any of the team that are in the training, but that's one of the ones that I, I've been learning recently and have been using that in some of the conversations that I'm uh, involved in. Okay. And Rory, do you have any free resources about the DISC assessment? Uh, if someone's looking to learn more about it, where would you point them? Uh, just to learn about DISC, I think uh, um, I would just, you know, again, Google is your friend. There's so much out there now around DISC and, and specifically yeah. uh, the DISC website, everything DISC, the website that we use has uh, a, a lot of great resources information on there as well um and even youtube there's some great videos where people walk you through the disc model that uh, that help highlight it what i would caution is there are some certainly you could do a free disc assessment online some are better than others uh, you know the one we use is a is a more expensive one but that's because we think the quality of it is there but you can certainly get a lot uh, there's a lot of good information out there just by by searching for it. but i don't have something specific that i would recommend to people because i usually just it's more of a conversation that i have with them okay um, Frank's got a couple questions. We've got two minutes, so I'll probably uh, trim this down. Um, thanks for all the wise words, Rob. You mentioned one of the founders grew up with a hostage negotiator. Do you know of Chris Voss and what do you think of his content? Do you know Chris Voss? Uh, I know Chris Voss. I haven't listened to any of his content, to be honest with you. I, I, uh, but yeah, um, so I wouldn't be able to comment on my thoughts on it. Um, with all this going on in the world and the influence of social media, where do you see empathy going? Will people be more empathetic or less? Uh, right now, I think uh, less. And I think the more, I think social media, uh, the social dilemma, the Netflix special, there's a lot about it that I can spit out. There's a lot of bones in it, but there's some great meat to it. And I do encourage people to watch that. The biggest challenge we have right now is we are all, um, are, uh, we're reviewing and reading media based on our beliefs. And one of the greatest, so I mentioned that I was a pastor for a lot of years. I was a, a fundamental evangelical hellfire brimstone, you know, turn or burn type of, of individual. Uh, when I left that world and I began this spiritual journey where I no longer believe that I, you know, some, some days I'm an atheist, some days I'm an agnostic. But one of the things that I really allowed myself to open up to was to learn about all the other spiritual dynamics and beliefs out there. It was one of the f- most freeing things for me. And I think one of the things if I could, you know, one piece of advice I would leave with people is um, whatever you believe, make sure that you're taking the time to discover and learn and read uh, people who have different views as you. 
uh, opposite views and don't have to buy into everything, but at least embrace it. Am I closed minded about it? First, one of the things I did, you know, I had an, an anti masker, anti vaccine kind of person, uh, rather than just go to them, well, blah, 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 I just said, okay, I want to understand, help me to understand. Uh, and I'll tie this in, and I know we're done our time, but I'll go into the podcast. One of the best podcasts I've learned that I love to wa- uh, listen to and to watch is Joe Rogan's. Uh, one thing about Joe Rogan, he's one of the best he, here. There's a guy you can learn how to ask questions. But one of the things that Rogan does so well is he has people on his show with completely opposite views as his. And he always takes the time. He wants to understand why they believe what they believe. And it's a practice that we can all, I think, uh, do better with. Amazing advice. Everybody jumping in at the Joe Rogan people, thing. People love Joe. <laughs> All right, Rob. Well, our time is up. Uh, again, yeah. I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time of your busy schedule to join us and, and help. And uh, hopefully over time, more of the team will be uh, introduced to you and, and work with you. And and uh, again, we're just we're very grateful for you. And uh, my, my pleasure. It's uh, it's always an honor to be around. This is one of my, I've mentioned this to Brock and to Eddie and to a few others. Uh, you guys are my favorite, and I really mean this, my favorite company to work for and work with. Uh, I'm a big fan of SEO Plus, and I think your best days are, are ahead of you. There's there's a lot that's gonna be accomplished with this team, and so kudos to you guys. So thanks for letting me be a part of this and spending the last hour with me. Appreciate that, Rob. Let's go Cowboys. <laughs> yeah, let's go Cowboys. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.